Before I begin, I'd like to thank Intuitive for this opportunity to talk today. There's been an amazing turnout to this meeting from academic and community surgeons alike, which just goes to show how robotics is truly impacting general surgery today. This platform gives me the opportunity to share how Intuitive has impacted my own general surgery and foregut practice in a relatively short amount of time. I transitioned from being a predominantly laparoscopic MIS surgeon to considering myself a robotic foregut surgeon. I hope that this talk provides some tools and motivation to transition your own practice. I trained under one of the best in the field, Dr. Santiago Horgan, and coming out of fellowship, I considered myself a strong laparoscopic surgeon with a great foundation of skills in foregut surgery. I was eager to prove myself at USC and had the support of my colleagues who fed me appropriate foregut cases. But while I was building my practice, I was asked to help train the residents on the newly acquired robot at the county hospital. This changed the trajectory of my course. By 2017, I had done a substantial amount of robotic general surgery cases, mainly inguinal hernias and gallbladders. I loved the robot for these cases and wanted to tr transition my growing foregut practice to robotics as well. It took about two years to make that transition. 2017, the majority of my hiatal hernia cases were laparoscopic. 2018, I pursued additional training and mentorship through the intuitive ecosystem. And by 2019, it was rare for me to do a laparoscopic case. What do I mean by the ecosystem? I mean all the additional support Intuitive provides to ensure success, including simulation and skills courses, peer-to-peer -peer education, and data analytics. Mentorship was one of the most critical resources that helped expedite my learning curve. This mentorship included case observations, video review, hands-on skills labs, proctoring, and then additional video review of my early cases. This process accelerated my transition from lap to robotic foregut surgery. Analysis of my own data showed that it took 35 to 40 cases to achieve proficiency, which was reflected in my operative times, which decreased from an average of 140 minutes down to 90 minutes per case. Now, I would like to share with you these tips and tricks for hiatal hernia repair that have enhanced proficiency and quality in my own practice. The first thing is to ensure that you set yourself up well from the beginning of the case, so that by the time you sit down at the console, you don't have to worry about what is going on at the bedside. I start with a camera port, 12 to 15 centimeters from the xiphoid in the left paramedian space, then two additional left upper quadrant trocars, one in the midclavicular line and one in the anterior axillary line, spaced approximately six to eight centimeters apart. I place a Nathanson retractor through an epigastric port, then a right upper quadrant trocar placed below the liver edge. I often use an 11 millimeter assist port in the right upper quadrant as well to help with efficiency during needle exchanges and mesh placement. The patient is then placed in reverse Trendelenburg position, about 30 degrees, and the robot is docked. I start with a vessel sealer extend, the fenestrated bipolar, and the caudier, then I switch to the mega suture cut needle driver towards the end of the case. I think about this procedure as two main components, hiatal hernia repair and LES augmentation. Hiatal hernia repair includes hiatal dissection, esophageal mobilization, curl reapproximation, and mesh placement. LES augmentation often includes division of the short gastric vessels, then the fund application of your choice which can be a Nissen, partial fund application, Lynx, or even a TIF. To demonstrate my robotic technique, I will go through a hiatal hernia repair step by step. The first step is hiatal dissection and esophageal mobilization. Key steps include exposure of the curl muscle to get into the correct plane, bluntly spreading the avascular tissue to reduce the hernia sac and release it from the curl muscles, circumferentially mobilizing the esophagus, and don't skimp on that posterior dissection. I start by retracting the fat adjacent to the right cruise to splay out the peritoneal covering. I then open the peritoneum so that the curl muscle fibers are exposed. This ensures that my dissection will continue outside the hernia sac. I then open along the entire length of the curl edge using the wristed vessel sealer 
before bluntly dissecting the hernia sac away from the mediastinal structures using the avascular plane. I continue mobilizing the sac anteriorly, spreading the esophagus down away from the crus before ligating tissue as the vagus nerve can be in close approximation to the apex of the hiatus. I then turn the wrist of the vessel sealer down to open along the left crus. I find that early in the transition from laparoscopy, many surgeons neglect to use the wrist efficient, efficiently, but when used to your advantage, it facilitates the hiatal dissection. Now, before moving on, I maximize my exposure and continue mobilization of the anterior esophagus. I push the nose of the vessel sealer into the avascular plane and spread gently making sure to ligate any vessels I come across to minimize any bleeding. I can clearly visualize and preserve the anterior vagus nerve during this, this dissection. That nerve will come into view right under my vessel sealer extend in the next move or two. Right there. I then make the posterior window by identifying the peritoneal covering and spreading gently along the confluence of the crural muscles. Once a posterior window is achieved, a pen rose is used to encircle the esophagus. Here is a good visual demonstration of how the fourth arm is used seamlessly to pass the pen rose through the slit and retract the end up to aid in retraction. Notice how I position the vessel sealer high in the abdomen so I avoid collisions with the fourth arm during retraction. The posterior dissection of the esophagus is critical to achieve circumferential mobilization and to prevent tethering posteriorly, making a speed bump at the hiatus more likely after closure. The robotic visualization in this plane is unparalleled and helps to achieve high mobilization of the esophagus. The small contributing vessels of the aorta can be ligated with complete confidence with the robotic platform. Here I'm just spreading the crura, or pleura gently away before ligating that tissue. The next step is crural reapproximation. This can be achieved using 2O non-absorbable V-lock or o ethabon suture. The camera is used to aid in efficiency and the hiatus is closed snug around the esophagus without impinging it. Here I'm starting with the ethabond. Um, this is really dealer's choice. I use the ethabond in this case, uh, but the V-lock works just as well. I'm gonna do figure eight suture, sutures with slip knots on the ethabond, and I'm gonna run the V-lock suture up the cruise. If you look at the video with the V-lock, I'm gonna do that slip knot here, and that just lets you sequentially take off some of the tension while tying these knots. I'll do the C in one direction, the C in the opposite direction, pull straight up on the needle side, and then that allows it to slip, tighten it by pulling in opposite directions. Now on the V-lock, we're gonna simply run this suture up the cruise, making sure it's equally spaced as we do so. You can see as I I'm suturing, I'm pulling out when I need to pull the suture th through and I'm coming back in closer. So I'm moving my camera a lot during this uh, portion of the case just to aid in efficiency. 
Um, again, on the Ethabon side, I'm going to do a slip knot again uh, for this upper stitch. You can watch that again. I'm going to pull straight up on the needle side. I can pull down on that to straighten it out to slip. That'll take off the tension. I believe in the two barrier theory. We want to make sure that the cruise is approximating the esophagus at rest without impinging on it as it does have a role in the barrier for reflux. You can see that whichever technique you use, you can get a great, great curl closure around the esophagus. The next step is mesh placement, which is considered optional, but I would be wary about skipping it. I place Phasix ST mesh. It's a monofilament mesh made from poly 4 hydroxybutylate which is naturally found in the body and metabolizes into CO2 and water. The mesh gradually transfers the load of the native tissue and stimulates collagen deposition around the mesh fibers. I find this reassuring since GERD patients are often depleted of collagen in their curl muscle. Unpublished data from my own institution so it shows that the use of Phasix ST mesh in large hernias greater than 5 cm reduces recurrence rates from 6.5% in the non-mesh group to 4.5% in the Phasix ST group. I cut the mesh with a notch at the top of the mesh for the esophagus, then leave 1.5 cm on the left and 2 cm on the right of the notch. I then leave 3 cm below the notch. This can be approximated intraoperatively using instrument tips as a guide. The mesh is then fixated to the hiatus in a posterior or reverse C position. The Phasix ST mesh is placed through the 11 mm assist port in this case, and as you can see, there's minimal distortion. The mesh is then placed in the posterior position, covering the hiatal closure. It is important that the mesh lies flat against the curl diaphragm to optimize its ability to promote tissue ingrowth and collagen deposition. I secure the mesh to the right cura using vicral suture. I then place a posterior stitch, lifting the inferior edge to visualize placement into the crus so I can gauge the depth of my stitch and avoid the aorta. The robotic platform aids in this step which was difficult to perform laparoscopically by mimicking open suturing techniques. I place this last suture in select cases when the mesh isn't lying flat. Again, I want good reapproximation of the mesh to the curl diaphragm for its best optimal results. This is how it looks in the posterior position. Next is an example of mesh placed in the reverse C position. I often choose to place it in this configuration in redo cases where an anterior recurrence has occurred. In this configuration, the anterior diaphragm and the posterior curl repair are adequately covered with mesh. Again, vicral suture is used to approximate the mesh to the esophagus, or sorry, to the diaphragm, ensuring that it does not touch the esophagus itself, minimizing risk of dysphagia. This is mesh in the reverse C configuration. Now that I have demonstrated my technique on a small hiatal hernia, I want to show you how these same fundamental skills are used to approach a large parasophageal hernia with the addition of a few small tips. I often change the camera view to optimize visualization in the large hernia cases, and I prefer a V-lock suture to sequentially relieve tension on the curl closure when the curl muscles are widely displaced. As you can see, this is a very large parasophageal hernia. I'm going to gently reduce the omental contents, but I leave the herniated stomach alone as I know it will reduce along with the hernia sac. I then retract the fat adjacent to the cruise to start this case in an identical fashion to the small hiatal hernia repair. 
I expose the peritoneal edge and cut down on it until the curl muscle fibers are seen. I then open the peritoneum along its entire length of the cruce, turning the wrist of the vessel sealer extend to aid in this dissection. Now I retract the hernia sac and bluntly spread the sac away from the mediastinal structures using the avascular plane. I continue mobilizing the sac anteriorly and towards the left cruce. To this point, I haven't deviated from my technique from the small hiatal hernia. Now you can see I'm having trouble reducing the hernia sac, but when I turn the camera 30 degree up, I can easily visualize the attachments that must be divided in order to reduce the sac. And now it comes down with ease. Another deviation I often make in these large parasophageal hernia cases is to make my posterior window within the mediastinum close to the G junction. This avoids retracting bulky stomach. I encircle the tissue at this point, and now I know when my penrose is beyond the hiatus, I can consider stopping my esophageal mobilization. I drive the camera high into the mediastinum to continue mobilizing the esophagus. By turning the camera 30 degree up at this point, I have clear visualization of the posterior esophagus and can ligate the small contributing vessels coming off of the aorta. This camera position is maintained to complete high anterior dissection as well. At this point, we are dissecting at the level of the inferior pulmonary vein. As the camera is pulled back, the complete esophageal mobilization is in view. I prefer to use a running V-lock suture for these widely displaced crura muscles so that I can throw several stitches and then sequentially tighten the suture, taking the tension off gradually, much like you would in the fascial closure of a ventral hernia repair. As I do this, the curl defect is becoming more horizontally shaped, so instead of continuing posteriorly, I switch to a lateral approach to reapproximate the curl diaphragm to the esophagus. As I release the tension on the esophagus, I notice I still have a gap anteriorly that I will close with an additional ethabon suture. Similar to my small hernia cases, a posterior mesh is placed. Now that the hiatal hernia is repaired, we can move on to LES augmentation. We have a variety of options for this portion of the case. I'm not going to go through all the reasons why I use one over the other, because that is a whole additional talk. To demonstrate technique, I will focus on the toupee fundification, which has become a popular choice due to its ability to control reflux with minimal side effects. The first step is division of the short gastric vessels. Enter the lesser sac with big bites and don't spread. Retract the fundus to visualize the splenic pole vessels, then continue up the left cruce to free the fundus completely. Division of the short gastric vessels start with obtaining access to the lesser sac. Retraction is used to expose the vessels. Then the vessel sealer extend is used to divide them. We want to avoid spreading during this step to prevent bleeding. Once in the lesser sac, we march up along the greater curve towards the left cruce.
high on the fundus, the retraction changes to push the posterior fundus medially, allowing for better visualization of the short splenic pole vessels. When bleeding complications do occur, it is likely from inadequate exposure of these vessels and blindly cutting tissue. Now with good exposure, impeccable optics, and the wristed instruments, these vessels can be divided with confidence all the way up to the left crus. Often, several bites are taken along the diaphragm to completely mobilize the fundus and complete the division of the short gastric vessels. The creation of the toupee fundiplication is the last step. The fundus will be passed through the posterior window. A shoe shine maneuver will be done to ensure the, a straight wrap. The toupee will then be sutured with no twisting, and an endoscopy can be used at the end of the case to check the integrity. Once adequate intra-abdominal esophageal length is achieved, the fundiplication can be started. I identify and grasp the ligated short gastric vessels high on the fundus and pass it through the posterior window. I then slide my grasper along the short gastric vessels to pull additional fundus through the window. A shoe shine maneuver is then performed to, to ensure the wrap is straight with no twisting. During this portion of the case, efficient use of the third arm is critical to achieving proficiency. Proper facilitation with the assist arm makes constructing the toupee effortless. The fundus is then secured to the esophagus and the curl diaphragm, stabilizing its position. The wristed needle driver aids in this stitch where a backhand approach is often required. The stitch is sutured down, keeping the fundus high on the crus. Two additional stitches will be placed between the fundus and the esophagus to complete this side of the wrap. We are careful during these stitches not to catch the anterior vagus nerve. Symmetrical stitches will be placed on the other side to complete the fundiplication. Studies show that the optimal length of a partial fundiplication is 3 to 4 centimeters, compared to the 2 centimeter length recommended for a Nissen fundiplication. At this length, the reflux control is excellent while the side effect profile is not affected. Here you can see that backhanded approach to stitch the uh, fundus up to that right cruise. Here's the complete toupee fund application. Tile Pro or picture in picture mode is then used to visualize the endoscopic view from the console, allowing the operating surgeon to assess the integrity of the wrap. The wrap should be straight, creating a hill grade one valve with an omega shape. This completes my demonstration of a robotic hiatal hernia repair with mesh and toupee fund application. I truly believe this platform enhances my ability to perform these cases with visualization that is unparalleled and tissue manip manipulation that is gentle and anatomic. When considering your transition, I highly recommend partnering with Intuitive and using the resources they have in place 
to ensure that your transition is smooth, fast, and safe. Thank you.